Hello, everybody. I'm sitting today here with Anne Batima in the Liceo in Barcelona. Anne Batima is Emeritus Professor of Geography at the University College in Dublin. Uh, she has done pioneering research in the field, in many fields, but particularly in the field of social geography with an impressive publication record. And among her many merits, one that I would like to stress here, is that already back in the 80s, she started a video dialogue. At that time it was video dialogue project, uh, to which our series of interviews for the Young Academy of Europe is very much indebted. And let me start with the beginning, and that means with your early years, the formative period, asking you what impulses did you get from family, from friends, but later on also from the Dominican community to which I understand you belong for many years, uh, both for your personal but also for your professional orientation. Wow, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a farm girl. I did a lot of work on the farm. Um, and I think the farming experience was very important. You have to think of so many things. You have to think of seasonality. You have to think about the cows and the calves and the chickens and the hens and, you know, the crops. And we had a very diversified farm. Um, my influence, my mother was a very religious woman. Uh, Daddy was, um, how would I say, he was very interested in the intellectual life and he wanted me to do well at school. So I think uh, both of those influences are very early, you know. Um, then I went to school, I was sent to school far too early and I was always two years younger than the people in my class which meant they persecuted me and it was only when I got to college that I could not tell anybody wh how old I was or how young I was and, and get along with the students, yeah. So um, I think the inspiration um, to do mathematics and Latin was uh, my rebellious time because only boys did that. And I wanted to be excellent in first class honors Latin and first class honors mathematics. But I got tired of the clergy and I got tired of the engineers, so I went to do geography for fun. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a marvelous geography teacher. So these are some of the early influences, I think. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, you want to talk about the Dominion? Well, yes, the I thing is, I, 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 I read about Mother Teresa, and she was a geography teacher in Calcutta. And I was a 21-year-old, and I thought, no, I'm strong and able to do things. I want to go to India and work with Mother Teresa. And my parents said, ooh, <laughs> you'll die a snake bite or something. <laughs> Why don't you go where your older sister is? And that is in North America. Uh, and she was a Dominican. And I, we were all anti-American at the time. It was the time of the Aswan Dam and all that. But I said, OK, if I go to India, the cross would be perhaps the physical environment. If I go to America, it'll be the social environment. <laughs> I went anyway. and I. Oh, I'm so happy I did. You know, these were wonderful years. Okay, yeah. Uh, mobility actually, uh, if I see it correctly, is an ingredient that goes like a leitmotif through all of your life. Oh, you just yes. mentioned that you went uh, uh, to join the Dominican uh, uh, University of Washington and then had positions uh, in Canada. Uh, but also in Europe, in different places, and I wonder, uh, and even even today, if, if 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 I'm not wrong, you're more on the road than <laughs> probably at home. Yeah. Uh, wh what was mobility 50 years ago, if I may say so? It's still a challenge for young researchers, and not only young researchers. Yes. But what was it like, and what associations uh, you have, or perceptions you have of the places where you have been? Okay. 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 Well, you see, in Seattle, um, I was the only one with any background in geography. And there was a, a, there was a program called Sister Formation where they wanted every young nun to have her complete degrees before they were ever sent out to teach. And there were streamlined courses with a capstone course for each of the streams. And there was social geography. It was supposed to be the capstone course for the social science sequence. 
So that's why I went to Seattle to the University of Washington to get a PhD. What was going on there, I didn't quite appreciate. It was very much the quantitative, logical, positivist, spatial analysis. It had lost what I felt was the soul of geography, which is the way people relate to the environment. And that was dropped because of environmental determinism and all kinds of Nazi associations. That it was rejected completely. And they were, everybody wanted to be a spatial analyst, which meant physical geography and human geography were separated. We lost the environment and we lost history. So I did my work with good help from Chicago on social geography in the European schools. Austria, Belgium, Netherlands, Sweden, France. And uh, uh, I produced all this stuff that nobody in the department knew about. So, and then, then I had lost a lot of weight and my superiors decided that I should be pulled out of graduates. Don't, don't go before you've done your preliminary examinations because at least we can list you as a doctoral candidate. If you don't do that, you'll have to start from scratch when you get back. So I did my examination and I gave a lecture to the board on social geography in these various European countries. And I took these chapters to my advisor and he says, my God, you've clicked. You have a thesis here. And then I was allowed to have three more months to get it into a thesis and that's how I got my PhD. It was, you know, very much um, scrambling to fit it into the time that I was allowed, you know. But I've concentrated on the French tradition. But, okay, mobility, it was difficult. It was difficult. Um, um, going to, to Belgium, uh, I knew French very well, but Belgian French isn't French French, you know. And then I had to learn Flemish because Louvain, the university where I was is in the northern part of the country, but I learned Dutch, and that was fine. It was it was really, but to existentialism and phenomenology were fields I had no contact with before that. Everything was logical positivist, but well, I had marvelous teachers. I read everything that I was suggested, and so that's what I brought back to my geography. I said we ha instead of looking at things as observers from on high and describing them in cart cartographic or other graphic language, let's talk to people on the street, you know, and see how they experience their environments. So my very first project was in Glasgow, looking at how working class families from the slums experience the, the shift to high rise living. Mm -hmm. And that operational model analytical model that I developed was used in hundreds of theses after that. It was an operational model of social space and it's still used as a way of understanding how people experience mobility from one place to another and identity. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned uh, phenomenology and existentialism before you briefly mentioned uh, your interest in Latin. So there, there, there is all this kind of uh, humanist uh, background that, that, that you have. Would you say that, as, as, as far as I can see, that, that must have been crucial also for the way that, uh, that, that you approach geography. And oh, yes. So, so, so I would like to ask you also, uh, having somebody with sensitivity for the humanities uh, as you, what? What, what do you think should be the role of uh, humanities uh, nowadays in, in academia? And what, what, what future do you see for humanities uh, in interdisciplinary projects, but also on its own? Yes, um, it's very hard to speak about the humanities without remembering the humanist, the, 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 the people from the humanities that I have met, uh, some of which whom uh, it was easy to make contact, but some of it was not easy, you know, because the humanity, there are people in the humanities that have no time for social science, you know, and so um, it, th th there have been difficulties. But um, for me, um, um, I never considered myself a humanist until I was invited to Sweden. And it was this project, this Glasgow project, that they read about in Sweden, and they said, my God, 
you know, come here and tell us, you know, because in Sweden everybody wants good social welfare. They want to do things well. They are benign social engineers, of course. <laughs> but uh, my approach was something that nobody had tried before then. And I was, uh, so I was invited there in 73, I spent three months, but <laughs> at the time I was writing a paper on values. And when uh, Torsten Hegerstrand, who was the great big name in quantitative spatial analysis, he read this thing and he said, this is a revolutionary document, and he translated it to Swedish. And he said, you must come back, you know, and teach us more about this humanist tradition. <laughs> this is the first time I was ever regarded as a human. Because there were people from the humanities in my own department at Clark University who didn't consider me. They said, you're far too humane to be a humanist. <laughs> you know? that, was, that was the remark. Anyway, so um, then I was back as a Fulbright professor in 76. And we had this big uh, seminar series that I organized on various themes about nature, space and time, knowledge and human experience. It was really to emphasize the, the question of knowledge and human experience. And we had meetings for four hours every Thursday. And, and we had 15 different disciplines that came. And then they said to me, my God, your ideas are so integrative. You know, you, you think integratively about things. Uh, you know, why don't you come back? And then they, they invited me back as a professor on the integration of knowledge. Yeah. So I don't know if this is... Uh, no, no, no. Or the humanities. Yes. Yes, the humanities. They're, they're, I'm worried about the postmodernist literary critics who turn everything into relativists. And you see, for, for a geographer, it is, it is really difficult because what we're dealing with now globally are situations where multinational corporations are taking over forests, natural resources from native peoples all over the world. And somebody asks the question, you know, who's, who has the right to these minerals? Who has the right to these forests? And these postmodernists say it all depends on your point of view. I think this is a relativism that is completely, to me, um, unacceptable. I think we have to deal with not only the, the historical but also the, the moral aspects of who has access to what resources. And to say everything is relativistic is, to my mind, irresponsible. So those are the people from the humanities that I have difficulty with. Uh, but there are people in the humanities who, who, with me, help to understand the cultures of places, literature, art, music. These are insights into the cultures of a people. So the geographies of places can be so much um, illustrated by these uh, inputs from the humanities. So I'm very fond of those people. <laughs> I would like to raise a question, which I'm not sure whether I can phrase it um, in a comprehensible manner, but uh, particularly after what you described in the humanist approach of your work to, to, to geography, um, I, I sometimes wonder, and I do in your case, whether these approaches, um, whether they are something unique, uh, which has to do very much with the biography of the researcher involved, or whether you would say that what you have done could be or could become a model or a school, or would you say this is, is it, is it reproducible in a certain sense, or would you say this is a very personal, uh, which does not mean subjective, but a very personal approach, which is not that easy to repeat because there come so many also biographical motives together that. Uh, it remains unique in a certain oh, way. I think this is totally reproducible. You okay. see, the thing in Sweden, they wanted a project on the integration of knowledge. And as good benign social engineers, their approach was to say, okay, we will design all grantsmanship uh, so that it only uh, supplies money to people who are already in an interdisciplinary way. And in fact, they invented colleges that were completely interdisciplinary, like Linköping and Karlstad and so on. 
And I said, okay, that, that is a top-down, uh, benign social engineering. But I, and there was, a very, there was a very strong feeling of being against specialization. They really felt that the specialization of research was fragmenting knowledge. It was also fragmenting the input of knowledge to sectoral planning, especially in Sweden. So I said, okay, no, look, I believe specialization is good. It's here with us and it has positive things. Let's find out what could be the potential common denominators for communication among specialists, okay? And it was this, it was, and, and mutual understanding. What, are, what could be the pillars, the bases for mutual understanding? And uh, you see, this was, this was uh, what I had done in the seminar, you know? Mm -hmm. And we put on, right after that, a workshop on creativity and environment with 60 retired and senior scholars. And I gave them an exercise book on, you know, what was it that was conducive to creativity in Europe? What, who were the people that were the most important? What were the ideas that were most important? And what conversation is still unfinished for you? Write down you know, the, the dialogue with the person with whom you have an unfinished conversation. And I also gave them a take-home exercise, which said, when you have a big job to do, where do you go? Why there? And that was the most insightful of all, you know, places. Places, for some, it was running in the woods. For others, it was a window overlooking the sea, etc., etc. Anyway, but nobody went to the office, or, <laughs> or did some say in the yes, office? Yes, some yeah. did. Yes, some okay. said they, they had an office and it had to be in a special corner where they had two windows. <laughs> you know. But no. But the point was, uh, what 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 people found interesting in the seminar and in the workshop was uh, telling their own stories. And so uh, I said, why don't we build on this? and interview people about their career histories. And that's the origin of the Dialogue Project. And they have been so effective in certain realms. You know, in interviews shown, for example, on, on health. I had one who was a big builder of lazarettes, that's huge hospitals, specialized hospitals. Another who was a social uh, medic, another who was a GP, another who had been to Africa as a, as a CEDA expert. And showing this to nurses, surgeons, you know, GPs, the, the people who never talked to each other within the health sector, they all knew the old henchmen, you see. So that was a basis for them to discuss what's important, at what scale should we be doing things, you know, etc. How would we do things better, etc. So, and then also in, in teaching the history of ideas. Uh, I, I, have, I assign one of these interview people to each student, and each student has to read the ten most important items of that person's work, look at the social context in which that work was produced, and then say, what are you going to do for your career? So for students, it is a, it's a bridge to another generation, and the, other, the time of another generation. So I think it is conducive toward integrating intergenerational communication, integrating the physical sciences and the human sciences, and I have, I have books written on what could be the bases, I don't know if you want me to go into that, but the bases of potential communication uh, among experts. Do you want me to go into that? No, but just take, take yeah. something okay. which you said, bridging generations. Yes. Uh, since 2012 you are the vice president of the Academia yes. Europea. Yes. And since this interview series is directed particularly, but not exclusively, to young researchers, I would like to ask you to reflect a little bit or to comment um, on uh, what what uh, is I mean, what can the Academia Europea, as an institution of very established scholars, do with a view to promoting young researchers? Uh, I mean, apart from being here, yeah. that's uh, certainly yeah. one thing you can do. But uh, do you have a policy as Academia Europea well, with regard to young researchers? Yes, I think this, this generation of young researchers are facing challenges that we never experienced. They have no archives. 
before, you know, the last two decades are devoid of archives because of the digitalization of texts. And so they, they are stuck with their computers and so there's, there's very little um, way for them to understand previous generations' work, except through these interviews. These interviews can at least awaken their curiosity about that. They can't give them all the insight possible. But the thing is, um, the challenge that they are going to have to face is, is a collective memory on science and how it's produced. Um, the other thing is, um, people, you know, in these video interviews, people express the, in body language, in emotion, you know, um, they, they express things that they would never have written. So my feeling is this, Academia Europea consists primarily of emeriti, and many of the emeriti want to contribute something, and they are rarely given an idea of what it is exactly that they could contribute, but there isn't a single one of them that couldn't contribute insights from their own career experiences. Nobody else is doing it. So uh, that's one aspect at least, you know. And uh, it's, uh, but I can tell you, that I've taught courses on the history of science, history and philosophy of science, uh, for many years. And for the student to feel like he can walk through the career journey of somebody of a previous generation, it's such an, an eye-opener for them about their own potential career experiences. Collective memory uh, is one of the challenges that young generation uh, faces. Yeah. But if we break it down to the more day-to-day -day challenges that uh, young researchers face, what, what are your recommendations and opinions about um, publish or perish, about having funding ideas if you have no project with money that Nobody. Um, I mean, these are these are worries and concerns that young researchers have. Yes. Uh, should they? I mean, they cannot simply not embark on this because somehow you have to go with the stream. Uh, but what 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 would your uh, recommendation be between resistance and uh, participation? Because it doesn't work otherwise. I know. I know. Get off your bloody screen. I think students today, at least in our university, they spend most of their lives on screen. And so there is very little uh, dialogue. And if you look at the history of science, most innovations occur through dialogue. Uh, these individuals, when they, they get examinations, they don't know how to write anymore. And so I think the, the, the tyranny of the screen is something that they have to become aware of. And even though there's a lot of interaction digitally, you know, through the screen, which is marvelous, you know, they have to know what they're looking for before they search. But most of the, of the innovations, creativity occurs from things that you were not looking for. It happens through dialogue and through, you know, uh, solipsistic, you know, browsing. So uh, I think that's that's one thing. Uh, the the social interaction aspect, I very worry about my my students at the moment. They're they're uh, they're very competent with the screen. They can do anything they like as long as they know what they're looking for. You know, uh, but but to be open to fresh ideas and to sharing thoughts across disciplinary boundaries, this is what the screen prevents. So I w that would be my one advice to students to, you know, find ways of being able to sit around a table and dialogue. You know, even with their things in front of them, that's okay. But just as so there's communication, I think. Time. Yeah. Instead of time, and not to be chasing one fellowship after the other, I mean, with all these short-term solutions. Uh, that's the other thing that's so... Would you say that you had more time? I doubted that you had more time. <laughs> but what was different? I mean, you did it. No? So yeah. Well, uh, uh, I'm worried about these postdoc two-year and three-year and four-year. You know, I, I worry about a good number of very qualified people that, of course, are the best candidates for these uh, multi-year postdocs. 
but it isn't a good career thing. Would a European career path be a solution or do you think this is something that uh, countries can handle in their own way each each for them? I don't know. Do I, mean, even a, I mean, do yeah. you believe in a more global solution or you think it's... I I I don't I don't really I haven't thought it through because I I don't have that experience I I've, I've had so many different um, places where I've worked I've I've been a visiting professor in Texas in the Sorbonne in Scotland <laughs> you know in Belgium uh, but I I never abandoned my my main position which was Clark University at the time and then later it was Sweden then it was Ottawa but uh, but I was um, I I don't know what advice actually to give because policies change all the time given ministries and so on. What I'd like academia to do is to be more uh, tightly in touch with uh, national uh, academies academies because national academies I think also are worried about changing ministry policies. And um, we had this very successful connection with the Austrian Academy, uh, Academia Europea, with the Austrian Academy. We've put on a series of workshops on Turkey and Europe. Yeah. And it, it's been very successful because it has, it has opened the Austrian Academy's uh, eyes to what Academia Europea can do. Mm. But I think also in the Irish and the Dutch, we've, we've had meetings of... Yeah. Academia members with with the local. So I I I'm not sure I've answered your question. <laughs> well, I, I mean, mm. it was a difficult question. So you yeah. don't, you don't have we we're just chatting about uh, yeah. your experiences yes. and yeah. perceptions. Yeah. You don't have to get the solution to problems that uh, no. nobody else could solve so far. Yeah. Uh, but particularly given your international background, from which you mentioned, I was interested in just knowing whether you see one more global solution. Mm. In the end. You returned to Ireland, right? Uh, is this sense of belonging, or oh, uh, or I've what? always wanted to go back to Ireland. Yes, but I wanted to go back to Cork. <laughs> Dublin okay. is a bit of a foreign country, you so know. Didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing was, and and this I think is a, is a, a global issue. Um, I thought I'd be welcome. I was sure that I had something to bring back to my own country, from all my experiences. I was totally wrong. I was completely unwelcome because the people in the department had been there for 20 years and they were sure that it would be one of them that would be chosen as professor. The queue. It blocked me out of all the required courses. They were nasty. Oh, it was a... T well, my dear husband helped me through this. He said, you have to understand where they're coming from. And he, yeah. But, you know, this happens to people who come from Africa and Asia to get PhDs in England or America. When they go back home, they are not welcome. So I think this, this is a global problem. Uh, should, we, uh, should we be inviting people from African countries and you know, women from different places if there is no place back home for them? Because in a way, all the people I've ever supervised from Africa and Asia, uh, I, I encourage them to go back home, yeah. you know. But it's yeah. it's a situation that I have experienced myself, and it has. This is a big issue on mobility, yeah. and that's one of the things we're going to do for Cardiff: mobility of academics, both teachers and students. What what are the implications, you know, for the future of these people? when they move from one place to another. It's, um, it's a question I don't have an answer for, because I, I, I didn't have an answer for myself on why I was so unwelcome. Well, but it's interesting to see that these problems, they have been there for a long time and they still persist. Yeah. And say Spain is also a good example yeah. for uh, the total refusal of people who want to were come back. trained abroad and want to come back, yes. uh, up to the point that Yes. Uh, the ministry has to invent special programs which allow them to come back because yes. it's a problem of mentality, as you said. That could be, yes, of, uh, yes. 
of um, people who are not so mobile and who are blocking those who yes. are yeah. more yeah. Yeah, but this is also the uh, important role of the international scientific organization involved. So within IGU, I could give place, I could give roles to these people within the International Geographical Union, which their home university wasn't giving them. And, and that gave them a sense of, oh, at least I'm contributing to some commission or some section, you know. And uh, yeah, so this, there's a role for the international scientific organizations here. Mm -hmm. This is why I want us to have connections with ICSU. It's a, yeah. It's a good point because there are more players in the game as Absolutely. we sometimes uh, yes. tend, to, tend to think and they, yeah. they could play yeah. a more prominent role. Yeah. I don't know whether you want to give, you have already been giving advice, uh, quite a lot of advice, but if you want to give some more personal message to our uh, audience and young researchers uh, concerning encouragement, yeah. encouragement after all the yeah. obstacles that we have yeah. mentioned. When students ask me for advice, I quote Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas said, if the issue is between your head and your heart. Follow your heart. I think it's very important that there be an emotional involvement with the subject. Uh, and then, you know, your head will follow. But if you're, if you're steered primarily by the cerebral, you know, it, it won't last. Like so I think like follow your heart. Like Pascal, no? Hmm? Like Pascal, the heart has its reasons, which, which reason, reason does not know. Exactly, exactly. Well, and thank you very much for this nice conversation that we had. And uh, we, I think, will look forward to following your research and uh, you. also your contributions, particularly now in the Academia Europea, uh, to getting some dynamics into a system which which needs uh, more thought. Thank you very much. Thank you too. <laughs> Thank you.